I'm really excited to share my in-depth review of the Vivo Active 4S. Is this the smartwatch that I've been searching for for all my life? Does it have all the necessary features at the right price point? Well, let's find out in this review. Now, this is a very long video review. If you're interested in a specific section, say for example, music, I've added chapter links in the description of this video. So the first thing I wanna cover is the build quality and the design. And as soon as I unboxed this smartwatch, I was really impressed with the premium type of feel it has. And that's attributed to the gunmetal type of stainless steel bezel it has on the smartwatch. It just looks very classy in that sense and less sporty than other watches like the Forerunner 245. Now the color I got is black or gunmetal and there are plenty of other colors like rose gold and pink and kind of a grayish color. So there's definitely lots of options for you depending on your taste. Now the bezel looks very premium in design and that's what you're paying for. And if you look on the side, it's actually made of a fiber reinforced polymer. And on the back side where the plate is on the case, it's just regular polymer. So it seems like it's very rigid. It seems like they put a lot of attention to detail on the case on the sides so that if you fall, it doesn't break if you crash it. And on the back side, it uses a basic kind of polymer, doesn't need to be protected, and it helps retain its light 40 gram weight. Another nice bonus is that it uses a strong glass on the display. It's using Gorilla Glass 3. The type of materials they've chosen on this device makes it very rugged, but still very stylish. One thing I noticed is that when I was walking around with the watch, I was dinging it on walls, and I noticed that there was no uh, scratches or dings on the screen. So I'm very thankful of the rugged design it has. Now you might be wondering why a six foot two, 220 pound guy chose the smaller version. Well, I really think that lightness and the small form factor is paramount for a type of fitness tracker I wanna wear 24 seven, especially when I'm doing my workouts or going to sleep. I noticed with bigger types of smartwatches that I wear, such as my Huawei Watch 2, is that my wrist kind of gets fatigued and I kind of get annoyed when I wear that during sleep. The regular Vivo Active 4, which is about 10 grams heavier, about 50.5 grams, it's also five millimeters bigger. It's 40 versus 45 millimeters in terms of the diameter. And the wrist strap is 22 millimeters on the Vivo Active 4, whereas the 4S uses an 18 millimeter wrist strap. I much prefer a smaller design. I'm really curious what you guys think, how it looks on my wrist. Please leave a comment down below and let me know what you think. I personally really enjoy it, so I don't care if you guys think it's kind of smaller or feminine or whatever, I really like the design. Now, if you prefer the larger Vivo Active 4, then that's a really big bonus for you because you basically get a bigger screen, much bigger, and you get a higher resolution display. So there's more information and it looks less pixelated. Now, like all other Garmin watches, it uses a standard type of band, which is really nice because you can go out and buy a third party type of band and customize your watch to your liking. This comes with an 18 millimeter band and it kind of has like a matte finish. There's little dimples. It looks really nice on the exterior. It's, it's made of a rubber and it's very comfortable on, in the interior of it. So I haven't had any issues sleeping with this band, uh, no rashes or anything like that. And during workouts and when I'm really sweaty, I notice that the band holds very well. The current 18 millimeter band comes with quick release pins, so it's easy to swap in different types of bands. What's nice about using third party bands is that they're a lot more cheaper than kind of buying the more proprietary bands, such as when you had a Fitbit, it would cost a lot of money and you were very limited in your selection. So this is a really big bonus. Overall, in terms of the build quality and the design and how this feels on your wrist, I'm extremely happy wearing my Vivo Active 4 throughout the entire day. This is a major win. So moving along with the hardware, you'll notice that on the back side of the smartwatch, there's a big bulge and it's not that annoying. The bulge actually doesn't really affect me at all. And that houses the sensors. There's two types of sensors, the pulse ox sensor and the optical heart rate sensor. And I'm gonna dive into those two types of sensors and show you whether it's accurate or not. One thing I wanna note is that the bulge really helps with the accuracy of the pulse ox and the heart rate sensor. I noticed on other types of watches that are have a more flat profile on the back where the sensors live, it's not as accurate. The bulge kind of helps keep the watch in place and monitor your heart rate and your pulse ox. One annoying thing is that a lot of gunk can get in between the crevices of the back of the watch. And this is a common occurrence I've had with Garmin watches. So you just have to routinely clean it out if you are worried about cleanliness. So you might be wondering, what is pulse ox? Well, it's Garmin's proprietary term for blood oxygen saturation level. And I'm gonna cover this type of sensor data in great detail when I cover the sleep tracking type of feature. So the heart rate sensor is very similar to the Forerunner 245. It's very accurate even during strenuous exercise. I noticed on the website that it's able to track your heart rate as you are swimming, which is a really cool kind of feature. Obviously this watch is swim proof, so you can go ahead and go in the ocean or in the water and swim just about 50 meters below the water surface. Now moving along the hardware, let's talk about the display. And to me, the display is very important. One of the most defining characteristics of 
Garmin watches historically have been the trans-reflective memory in pixel displays. And basically what that means is that it's a very low battery consumption type of display that's always on. And the way the technology works, uh, MIP or memory in pixel, is that it's able to update only certain pixels and all the other pixels can re re retain their position. And this allows it to be very battery efficient. Now, I love this display because it's always on. I'm able to use my fitness tracker, my smartwatch as an actual watch. I can look at it and I don't have to use some kind of gesture feature. I can always have the time on me. So that's been very convenient and kind of like an essential feature I look for in any future smartwatch. The downside is that when you're using it in a more dark environment, it uses the backlight, kind of like a blue tinted backlight to actually light up the display. And when you're looking at the display with the backlight on, it looks very washed out, very low contrast. And to me, it looks very ugly. So you kind of make trade-offs, you know, do you want an always on display that's very battery efficient? Or do you want some kind of like OLED display or your typical LCD screen that hogs a lot of power, but also looks very nice. Another downside to using a more traditional like OLED display or LCD screen is that it's very hard to see in the sun. So it requires you to increase the brightness which kills your battery. With this, this always works in the sun. So when you're doing activities outside, it works very well. So honestly, I'd rather have a washed out blue tinted type of backlit display than have kind of a more of a traditional type of display. Now I noticed Garmin released a very similar type of smartwatch called Venue, and it uses a more traditional type of display, but I'd much, much rather have a always on display because I can treat my smartwatch as a basic watch. Not having to like do some crazy gesture to just look at the time, just being able to quickly glance at the time, see some kind of metadata, some complications has been very convenient throughout my life. So obviously the display is a touchscreen, and I find that interacting with the software on the actual smartwatch is very intuitive. And I noticed that the touchscreen doesn't screw up or doesn't become kind of weird and janky. It's actually very responsive and very accurate. So zipping through menus is very nice using the touchscreen. Now, in terms of comparing this to the Forerunner 245, do you prefer a non-touchscreen display and just use kind of four or five buttons? Or would you rather have a touchscreen and use two buttons? Personally, for me, I find the touchscreen more than adequate and it's been very kind of intuitive to use. And sometimes using the Forerunner 245, you're just restricted to buttons. Sometimes I see myself touching the screen and I kind of want to tap stuff. Basically, I much prefer a touchscreen. Now, in terms of the two physical buttons, it has been a welcome addition of an extra button. Originally, the Vivo Active 3 usually has one button. This extra button kind of helps with kind of navigation. Maybe you're moving back or you're interacting with a strength training app or some type of exercise, it relies more on a tactile feeling and it's more accurate than a touchscreen. So this addition to two buttons has been very welcomed. I'm happy for them to add more buttons so we can have more shortcuts and gestures. So the next thing I wanna talk about is the battery life. And when you look on the box of the Vivo Active 4S, you notice that it has up to seven days of battery life and it has five hours of music and GPS simultaneously running at the same time. So that's pretty good in terms of if you're gonna be running and tracking your running with GPS and have music, it's five hours is pretty lengthy. I don't think people run for more than five hours. And in terms of the seven day battery life, it hasn't been that much for me because I'm using Pulse Ox. And Pulse Ox, while you're sleeping or all day Pulse Ox tracking, which is a really unique feature to Vivo Active 4, which I'll cover very shortly, that type of sensor actually eats a lot of your battery because it uses a red LED. It's actually a lot stronger than the green LED, which uh, monitors your heart rate. So in terms of the actual battery usage I've had when I'm using the Pulse Ox feature, let's say I have Pulse Ox enabled for all day tracking. I get about four nights of sleep with it, which is actually still really good. I'm still impressed that it's able to kind of last that long with the Pulse Ox running all the time. Now, I didn't do any kind of music or um, like uh, running, any kind of GPS tracking. I did do a couple strength training exercises. I receive a lot of notifications on the watch. I interact with the watch, you know, use the backlight on the lowest brightness. You don't need it that uh, bright. Now, if I actually disable the all day Pulse Ox and I just switch to sleep only tracking, so basically you'll set your start and end time when you fall asleep. It'll actually track that entire duration as you fall asleep. Typically what I capture when I'm sleeping is about seven hours worth of data of pulse ox. And that increased my battery life to one extra night. So in terms of all day pulse ox tracking versus sleep only pulse ox tracking, you only get about a day. So it's not much of a big difference. I imagine if you disable pulse ox, you're likely to be able to get the seven day battery life. One thing I notice is that when I'm using the music feature and I'm trying to sync, let's say a podcast, it really does eat a lot of my battery. That's because it's using Wi-Fi to download the podcast or the songs. So just be mindful of that. If you're downloading songs and listening to music, your battery life will be severely affected. Now, I actually measure the time it takes to charge this device 
from 0% to 100%. And for me, it was about one hour and 10 minutes, which is absolutely acceptable. So in terms of actually using the watch and the software and all the menus and navigating through the watch, what has changed from the previous Garmin series? Well, not much has changed. It's still very intuitive. I really like using the touchscreen and the two buttons to kind of navigate around, as I mentioned before. For example, they added some gestures or a shortcut. You can actually swipe right, and that will show a, let's say, a flashlight or a music control. So they've, they've really taken advantage of the touchscreen. Now, navigating the device is really simple. For example, if you want to start a strength training exercise or any type of activity or start an app, you simply tap the top button once and you're right into your menu and you can select your exercise. You also use the top button to stop and start certain types of exercises or activities. The back button is usually to just get out of menus or return back to the main kind of screen. One of the main gestures is swiping up and down on the main watch face. And that's going to cycle through all your widgets. And widgets gives you information such as a calendar, notifications, your weather, and all that type of other information that you can customize in the Connect app. Another common type of navigation is long pressing the top button to kind of show a bunch of controls. And that can give you shortcuts to maybe enabling do not disturb, turning on your flashlight, saving a location, or more importantly, getting to Garmin Pay. Now, long pressing the bottom button will get you into your history and most importantly, your settings. So from there, you can just kind of customize and tweak everything. Let's say, let's say you want to change your watch face you'll access it by using the long press on the bottom button gesture. One really nice software update I noticed is that when you're doing, let's say, an activity, let's say strength training, you're able to actually swipe to the left and that will reveal your main watch uh, kind of interface. So you can access your, you know, you're just basically, your entire watch is completely free to use. So you can see notifications, you can do other types of things. It's almost like multitasking where you have an activity and you can swipe between the activity and the main watch face and obviously all the widgets that come with it. Now, like I said before, navigating, moving through the menus has been very zippy and very fast. One thing, however, that kind of annoys me and is a little scary to you sometimes is when I'm interacting with a notification, I might accidentally hit a quick reply because it's so fast and doesn't know that like, confirmation. So there can be some embarrassing moments where you see notif where you reply to a notification by accident or something like that. So let's talk about the watch faces. And this is really important because we all want to customize our smartwatch to our own taste. And thankfully, there is a whole market where you can go out and you know get kind of third party type of watch faces because the Garmin default native watch faces are very uninspiring, although very functional in their terms of use. Now, for example, you can see this watch face. I need complications. I need to see the weather, the date, obviously the time, and maybe some extra information like the next calendar event. As you can tell by this watch face, it just looks very boring and basic. There's a lot of white space. There could be so much more that they could add. And in terms of the aesthetic of it, it just looks very ugly. Now, one thing that really annoys me is that these complications, so basically on your watch face, you can see extra data. You can't interact with it, like kind of like what you can do on Wear OS. It works totally fine. You can't interact with it. So let's say, for example, you have the weather widget or a complication. You want to tap it to get to your weather widget and see more information uh, regarding the weather. And you can't do that. So it's just, I don't know why they can't do that. I mean, come on, it just... It's really unfortunate in terms of that, and it's kind of annoying. Now, I want to share my favorite watch face, and it's called Sky Tracker Anti-Aliasing. And what's really nice about this watch face is that it looks very aesthetic. It occupies or uses all the screen real estate to fill it with purposeful information, such as the weather. It's very detailed. It kind of gives you illustration of what the weather looks like, a little description with the temperature. It also gives you things like your battery life, the uh, detailed date. The time looks beautiful. You can fully customize it and configure it as you wish, but you'll need to upgrade to the premium version. And I really do think it's worth the minor cost to upgrade. Now, the next thing I want to talk about is sleep tracking. And to me, this is really a feature that I'm very passionate about. I really care about my sleep. I really care about tracking my sleep just because it's so important for me. And I get really poor sleep because I have a condition known as sleep apnea, which is basically prevents you from breathing as you are sleeping. Now, one of the main reasons why I went out and bought the Vivo Active 4S is that it finally has all day pulse ox tracking. And to me, this is a major, major win. I was super excited to use this feature and I'm super happy with the way it's working right now. Now, like I said before, using all day pulse ox does really eat your battery life. So what I do is I disabled that, but I enabled it during sleep tracking. Previously on a lot of Garmin devices that I've tested, like the Vivo Smart 4 or the Forerunner 245, it only tracked four hours of your pulse ox, which is 
basically nothing. I mean, I sleep for eight hours or sometimes more. I want to see all that information. I want to see like high resolution data of my pulse ox as I'm sleeping, because in order to properly understand your sleep patterns and diagnose issues, although this is not a medical device, so don't use this to medically diagnose your sleep apnea if you suspect that you have it based on snoring, gasping for air, or feeling fatigued during the day. What I'm trying to say is I really like being able to see all this data because it, it helps me make more informed decisions. And thankfully, this works pretty much what I expected to by kind of setting your start and end time when you fall asleep and when you wake up, it will enable pulse ox tracking. So I'm able to get around seven hours of pulse ox tracking as I'm sleeping. And to me, this has been a fantastic feature. I'm really excited. Now, sleep tracking in terms of the more normal features like sleep stages and movement and all that other type of stuff, detecting your deep sleep versus REM sleep versus light versus being awake. All that stuff is very accurate and works just as the previous Garmin devices I've tested before. So sleep tracking is you know, first class type of data tracking that they present. And accessing this information on the desktop web app or using the kind of connect app on your Android or iOS device is very pleasant. The, the way they display the information, the way you can access it and seek through the graphs is absolutely amazing. They've done really well in showing this type of detailed sleep information to you. The one thing that I do criticize them is they don't have uh, nap tracking. And that to me is, it really sucks because I nap during the day and I wanna be able to like see if this napping, you know, affects my kind of overall sleep pattern and stuff like that. So it's really annoying that they don't track naps. Having a nap does affect your body battery. What happens is that when you nap, your energy reserves will increase. So your body battery will go up and it will properly reflect that, but it doesn't show that you napped. Another feature that I heavily criticize Garmin for not adding to their sleep kind of information in the Connect app is the ability to kind of annotate your sleep. So let's say one night you were doing something, maybe you're drinking a lot of alcohol and you're feeling really tired. You want to be able to annotate it so that maybe you can look back. It's like, oh, I got no deep sleep because I was out, you know, drinking and stuff like that. This type of customization to our sleep data, I really wish they would provide. One little thing I want to add about the pulse ox tracking, if you're only tracking during sleep, is that if you kind of exit the boundary of what you set your sleep pattern. Let's say you go to sleep at 2 a.m. and you wake up at 9.30 a.m. If you sleep more than 9.30 a.m., let's say you wake up at afternoon or in the whatever, it's not going to track your pulse ox from 9.30 a.m. to the time you wake up. It only tracks the time that you kind of whitelisted. So that is um, unfortunate, but it helps save your battery in the long run. If you really care about getting your all, all your pulse ox, you can totally just enable all day pulse ox tracking, which is actually really neat. And it only eats one extra day of battery life. So it really depends on what you want. I compared the pulse ox data captured from the Vivo Active to the data captured with a dedicated SpO2 sensor called the Loki Ring Sleep Tracker, which I actually covered in a full depth review on my channel, so check it out if you're interested in that. The results are stunning. I tested the two devices on two different people, one being myself who is diagnosed with sleep apnea and someone who does not have sleep apnea. As you can tell by the results, both devices show that I have some sleep issues when I'm not using my CPAP therapy. And you can see that the other person without sleep apnea had a much improved blood oxygen saturation throughout the entire night. So I'm actually quite impressed with the accuracy of the pulse ox, and I'm very happy that I'm able to monitor it 24 seven. So another feature they were marketing pretty heavily during the Vivo Active for kind of ads was respiration tracking and how many breaths per minute do you take? And to me, this is a kind of a cool feature. I was like very intrigued by it. Perhaps, you know, if you have sleep apnea and you stop breathing as you're sleeping, obviously your breaths per minute will be reduced. And I was looking at the data, it doesn't really help me that much. One interesting thing to note is that if you disable pulse ox entirely, you still get respiration rate. So that means that it's not using the pulse ox kind of data to kind of calculate this type of breaths per minute. It's actually using the heart rate sensor. And I've tried looking on in the app or on their website and understanding how this uh, breaths per minute kind of kind of works and what what exactly are we trying to do with this data that's that's something that I've kind of been annoyed with Garmin is that they present all the data very well and body battery has been very helpful in determining how tired or how, how, if I should take a rest or if I'm very stressful but I wish it was more kind of sent you insights or send you more contextual data about the data that you've been tracking so the respiration rate is being tracked as you fall asleep uh, 24 7 so I'm not sure what useful what uses out of this Please let me know down below in the comments if you can help me understand this. I'm trying to do some research on this and I unfortunately, I'm sorry, I didn't find that much information. So it hasn't been a very helpful or useful metric. Now there's one little nitpick I want to say about sleep tracking in general with Garmin. And it's basically, they, it's kind of what I said before, they don't kind of provide any insight to your sleep tracking. All it does is show you 
uh, kind of very objective data. Like here, you've, this, you've had this much REM sleep, you have this much deep sleep, and this is your total sleep. That's great. I mean, that to me is already a very helpful metric. And you can use that to help improve or motivate you to go to sleep more often and obviously get more sleep. I really wish they would provide some kind of sleep score or some kind of calculation of whether my sleep was good, good of good quality or bad quality. And I noticed that Fitbit is doing this. So I don't know why they can't, you know, crunch all this data and compare it with their peers, with our peers, and kind of provide some kind of scores. I really wish Garmin would provide more insights to our data. Now, another major feature they've added since the Vivo Active 3 is body battery. And I really like this feature. It really is kind of accurate in some ways. Sometimes it's kind of off. It's kind of scary how it knows more about your body than you know about yourself. Sometimes I look at the body battery and it's showing me at 20%, but I feel fully, fully tired. But then within an hour or two, I completely crash. It's using some kind of magic data to calculate this type of body battery percentage in terms of how full you are. If you have a full battery, you're ready to tackle the day. I've had times where I was 100%, but I felt really tired. It doesn't really account for caffeine or other types of things that affect your body, like water intake and stuff like that. But it has been a good kind of proxy to estimate whether you are tired or good to be tired or whether you're active and should do, should do a lot of work. Personally, for me, sometimes I find body battery a little weird because you kind of have this machine, this device telling you that you should be tired or you should be fully active, whereas like sometimes you feel differently. So it might have a weird psychological effect on you if you look at this data very religiously. Okay, so let's talk about the next feature and it's Garmin Pay. This is a major improvement over the Forerunner 245. I'm really shocked that that watch, which is really expensive and almost the same price in terms of the music edition compared to the Vivo Active 4, doesn't include Garmin Pay, but this one does, and I'm very thankful of that. This, to me, is a very handy feature if you want to go out for a run and you don't want to carry your big bulky wallet or carry your phone that has NFC like Google Pay or Apple Pay. Now, my main issue with this is that it's supposed to be more convenient. It's supposed to augment your life. These, you know, wearables are supposed to make things more simple and more convenient. What I find really annoying is that if I want to, let's say I'm at the grocery store and my hands are full, I just want to simply tap the terminal and just pay. I don't have to, I want to fit all the buttons or enter a pass a passcode. The experience with Garmin Pay has been absolutely awful. You have to long press to get to the control menu. You have to tap a very small icon, the little wallet icon, to open Garmin Pay. And if you haven't entered your passcode recently in the past, I don't know, couple hours, you're going to have to enter it again. So you enter four digits. Finally, you can actually tap the pay. I use Google Pay and it's pretty much instant. I take out my phone, kind of works like a credit card. You don't have to enter any passcode. You can just turn on the device and just tap. And it's really convenient and really fast. The whole point of having a smartwatch is to kind of go hands-free and just tap the terminal. This has been the opposite experience. So I can only see the benefit of using Garmin Pay if you intend to go out without any type of credit card NFC chip or your phone. Now, on a more positive note, using Garmin Pay is extremely fast. As soon as you get it ready, tapping the NFC terminal is very fast. And I noticed that on Wear OS, sometimes it like misses or lags or you have to hold it for a long time. This is like instantly, it completely works uh, really fast. So I might have been a little harsh. I found out in a later software update that you can actually go and customize your shortcut. So when you swipe to the right, you can actually open your wallet. However, you'll still need to enter your pin, which is still a cumbersome experience. This also occupies the shortcut for your music control widget, which I would rather have here. All right, so my next smart feature is very important. It's notifications. Smart notifications are excellent on Garmin watches. They are kind of like the world industry leading, in my opinion, because they just work so well, especially on Android. What happens is you get a notification and you get a little pop-up, a little vibration, ha uh, haptic feedback on your wrist and you can see the title and you can see the content of your notification. And for me, being able to glance at my notification really quickly and kind of scan it and get all the information has been very convenient and making me use my phone a lot less. Another thing that they do really well is present all your notifications on a widget, kind of summarizing all the notifications in kind of a list. And to me, this is very helpful because I never have to really go to my phone Let's say I wake up, I can see all the notifications and it's very convenient just to be able to kind of glance at all of them all at once. Now, despite the Vivo Active 4 s having a smaller display, I find that notifications are very crisp and very legible and easy to read. Interacting with the notifications is very intuitive. Once you get it, you're able to tap and kind of swipe up and then as you swipe up, you can reveal the quick actions or the inline actions that are contextual to the notification. Now, this is a feature kind of only on Android, unfortunately, because iOS has a very closed system. Damn you, Apple. And what this means is that you can interact with notifications. So for example, I'm using a Transit Now app and I'm able to monitor, track my streetcar or my bus, and I'm able to set a timer right from the notification. So it's been very convenient to maybe do a quick reply 
or interact with custom developer actions provided in the app that I'm using. Now, in terms of responding to messages like SMS or WhatsApp or Messenger, you're able to a quick reply and that's really convenient and you can go into the Connect app and just customize the type of reply so that it doesn't look very cookie cutter. So one of my major complaints when using Garmin smartwatches is that there's no voice reply. We should be having it at this point. We're in 2019, voice is all around us. We have these Google assistants and Alexas. I really wish that they added this feature in this type of watch because there's times when I just wanna to respond to a text message, but I can't because the preset replies are completely non-contextual to the conversation. And while we're on the subject of voice replies, please Garmin, please include some voice assistant like Alexa or Google Assistant because I noticed that when I wanna set a timer or set an alarm, it's really annoying, it's really cumbersome. I have to go through all these menus, tap a bunch of buttons, and it's just, I really wish I could just say, you know, set a timer for 20 minutes and just kind of go with my life. This is how a smartwatch should work. Unfortunately, this is stuff that you will get on a Wear OS or Apple Watch, but you trade off a lot of other things that Garmin is really good at, such as, detailed fitness tracking and always on display. Okay, so back to smart notifications. Another nitpick I have when using smart notification is that I found that the vib vibration haptic feedback to be actually really strong and kind of annoying. Now what you can do is you can go into settings and you can actually set it to the lowest type of intensity, but I still find it at the lowest intensity, it is very strong. This, this motor, this vibrator, whatever it's inside here, is very strong so it's kind of annoying and i really wish that the do not disturb button was more accessible what you need to do is long press the top button to get into the control menu and then tap a small button the do not disturb that i guess is okay but like if i want to quickly stop notifications it just feels like a lot of steps i think the long press gesture having to hold it for so long <laughs> it just slows down the whole process i really wish garmin would just allow us to customize the way that our buttons work such that perhaps when you press the top button, it opens the control menu, which is something you would use more day to day and more often, for example, getting access to your Garmin Pay. And long pressing it would be do the opposite. It would actually kind of start an exercise or show you the menu for all your activities, which is something that I do maybe once in a blue moon. Now, one thing about annoying notifications, if you're getting spammed a lot, you can always block the app. In fact, you can go into the Connect app and you can customize which apps can send you notifications. But ever so often, you know, I can't disable Messenger because I receive important texts through that but sometimes someone will be kind of having a conversation and they'll send like 20 texts in like a minute and you, your, your wrist is just vibrating like zzz, 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 and it's just super annoying. Okay, so for the next topic, this one is really important and it's the strength training exercise activity. Now there are a lot of activities, there's you know snowboarding, running, walking, auto tracking, it does all these crazy activities, but for me, going to the gym and lifting weights is something that I do very, I do very often and it's very important for my health. You might be someone that is going to the gym regularly lifting weights or you want to do this. Now, why am I kind of advocating for Garmin's fitness trackers in the gym? In summary, it's basically a coach, someone that kind of yells at you and kind of helps you focus on doing your set. And what I mean by this is sometimes you go to the gym and you end up kind of like wasting your time. Sometimes you're on your phone or you're, you know, you're on Instagram and you're swiping through images and stuff like that. And you end up wasting a lot of time in between sets. So let's say you do kind of like, let's say 10 chest presses and you take a rest break and you sometimes you lose track of time. Now, the nice part about Garmin watches, fitness tracking in general, is that it's able to detect when you start and stop an exercise or a set. So let's say you did 10 chest presses and you put the weight down and then you kind of just take a break. It'll automatically detect that you stopped you know, doing your exercise. And I'll show you this kind of countdown, this kind of rest timer. By looking at the watch as you're walking around, you can see that, oh, I've wasted three minutes just kind of browsing on the internet or doing nothing. And then it kind of forces, reinforces you to stay focused and finish your workout. Now, personally for me, I hate going to the gym. After going to the gym for so many years, it gets really monotonous. And I just want to go in there, do my workout and just get out really quick. I don't want to be in the gym for more than an hour. What's also nice about this is that you can see the elapsed time you've spent in the gym. So let's say you've spent already more than an hour in the gym. You know that you're wasting time, so you should speed up and kind of get out. So I really hate the gym. The This watch has been a personal coach for me. It has helped me stay focused, motivated, and very kind of get in, get out type of mentality when it comes to the gym. Now, unfortunately, there are some issues with the auto set and the rep counting. Now, rep counting is generally accurate. It's able to detect how many reps you do. Let's say you do 10 reps on a chest press, that's fine, it works, maybe plus or minus one, no big deal. Now, when detecting the type of exercise you are performing, let's say you're doing a squat, let's say you're doing a front squat, it's 
completely messes it, messes it up sometimes. And I'm really shocked by this because this new watch, the Vivo Active 4, actually includes new sensors like a barometric altimeter, a gyroscope, and obviously has the accelerometer and other types of sensors. I don't understand why the Garmin develop, or the Garmin engineers cannot use this information to determine what type of movement you are making. When I was using Wear OS, I was really shocked at how well it was able to detect the type of movement I was doing. It could, de it could differentiate between a upper chest fly versus a dumbbell uh, chest press. This watch, and like all other Garmin watches, still to this day, with all these sensors and all this stuff, cannot detect the type of exercise I'm doing very accurately. It still does the job, it still kind of works, maybe 30% of the time, <laughs> I'm not sure. But it's just really, really kind of disappointing at this, this point in time that with all these sensors, it's still not doing the right job. Now it gets worse, unfortunately. I was really excited about the auto set feature. I was using this feature where basically if you start your exercise, you start doing your reps, it'll detect the, uh, you, you started doing your reps. And as soon as you stop, it'll, it'll notice that you are completely stopped doing the exercise. So it times exactly when you start and send, end your set. That way you get very, very accurate tracking of when you start and stop your set and the rest time between sets. So that was very helpful. But I noticed that for some exercises, it's not detecting my set at all. So let's say, for example, I'm doing a front squat and I have my hands like this and I'm doing the front squat. It did not detect it at all. Or I'm doing a, a machine, I'm doing a chest fly, kind of like this kind of motion, and it did not detect the motion at all. Other motions, like very obvious, like maybe a, maybe a back squat or bicep curls, it was detecting it totally fine. And I thought it was working completely accurately, but it's not. Another issue I had with other, let's say the Vivo Smart 4 was that it would wrongly detect an exercise. So I'd be walking around the gym during my rest break and it would actually detect that I started an exercise. Thankfully with this watch, it doesn't do that. However, it's sometimes not detecting my, the start of my exercises, which is really annoying. Sometimes you have to you know, manually start the, the, the type of exercise you wanna do. And it gets very confusing when you have auto set feature on. Sometimes it doesn't work and sometimes it does. And it's very confusing because you don't know when you should actually press the button to start the exercise. So to me, this is almost a deal breaker. I thought that it was really good. I thought it was detecting my exercises. The auto set feature wasn't working, so I'm kind of really just depressed and disappointed about this feature. So if you don't want to use the auto set feature, you can completely disable it and you can revert to kind of the manual start and stop your sets. Thankfully, it's using the bottom button to kind of start and stop your set. What I noticed that when I was using the Vivo Smart 4, which is kind of more reliant on touchscreen, touching the button when I'm sweaty could sometimes accidentally press the wrong button or it would double tap instead. So it was really frustrating to use. Now we're using a physical button, so st stopping and starting your set at least is isn't as bad as it is on a fully touchscreen device. Now, another really cool feature with strength training is that you're able to download exercises and you basically download a whole regiment and it kind of gives you, let's say like, you know, 20 minute bodybuilding upper chest, upper body type of exercise. And it prescribes you all these different types of exercises. And what's really cool is that if you're new to strength training and you want to get into it, it actually shows you an animation or a kind of an illustration of how you do, let's say chest press, for example. Now, I think these preloaded workouts you can actually customize and create your own which is nice but i find that this doesn't work into my into my lifestyle when i go into the gym because sometimes for example someone is using the machine that i wanted to use so i have to change the order so it's kind of hard to use this when you are using a more dynamic type of workout or let's say you know maybe you want to do something completely different mix it up it doesn't really fit into my uh, workout plan so I found this feature pretty much useless for me, but I definitely can see it being very helpful for people who are new to the gym and kind of just want to follow a type of kind of regiment prescribed by someone else. So the next thing I want to talk about is GPS tracking and running. And I'm not much of a runner. In fact, I don't run at all. So I went out and I tried this device and I found that it was very accurate in terms of my GPS tracking. One thing I did notice though, it did take quite a while to kind of lock the GPS signal. It took around five to 10 seconds and I was downtown. So there were a lot of tall buildings kind of maybe messing up with my GPS tracking. But overall, it was able to very accurately detect my entire path that I was taking. And it shows you a lot of stats and information such as your pace and you know your average velocity in terms of how you run. So this is very cool type of metrics for people who are into running. Now I'm not into running, so I don't really care about this feature too much, but I think it's more than adequate for people who are just into basic running. Now, the one thing that defines the Forerunner 245 is that it provides a lot more advanced metrics and tracking when it, when it comes to running. If you are into more running marathon and all that type of stuff, you might wanna research the differences between those type of features that are offered on the Forerunner 245. Now, one thing that Garmin offers during only activities, unfortunately, it's only during activity is incident detection. So let's say you were running and you fell 
and something really bad happened to you, it's able to detect that and kind of send a message to your emergency contacts. Now, unfortunately, this only works when you're connected to your phone. So I kind of find this whole feature kind of useless. And I was surprised to know that this only works during activity. I thought that I could use this smartwatch, walk around my house, and if I fell down, it would kind of detect that. But unfortunately, it's only during an activity. Now, in terms of auto tracking, basically being able to detect an activity without having to go into your watch and kind of start it automatically, I noticed that it has been very accurate. It was able to detect all my walks, all my runs, and all my cycling, all my bicycle movement very accurately. So that was really cool. But the only thing is that it's not going to have any GPS back data because obviously it's not going to be burning through your GPS. If you want very detailed information, you'll need to go into the smartwatch and obviously start the activity. Okay, so moving all along this large list of things I have to talk about, the next smart feature I want to talk about is music. Now, for me, music is not important for me, especially on a watch. I noticed that a lot of gyms that I go to that I visit, if you're doing your exercise, they're very loud. They're blasting music so loud. They're blasting EDM. And for you to listen to your own music, even with like noise canceling type of headphones, you have to put your music really loud. And I have tinnitus. So I have a constant ringing in my ears. My ears are very damaged from the younger years of listening to music without protection. I can't listen to music in such a loud environment. So I really don't use this feature a lot. Now the times when it's actually quiet in my gym and I want to listen to a podcast, that's definitely what I do. But I just find having music on my smartwatch not very helpful at all because it's a very cumbersome experience. What I normally do is I load Google Podcasts and I'm able to like browse and download all the music and kind of just connect it to my headphones with Bluetooth and it just works from my phone. I always find that I have my phone with me when I want to listen to music. So I don't see the benefit of having just only music on your smartwatch and just going out running with your smartwatch. Now, if you are the type of person that wants to go out, not carry a wallet, not carry any type of phone, but listen to music, then yeah, for sure. The music on this type of smartwatch is going to be a very nice essential feature for you. But for me, it's completely useless. And what's worse about this is, like I said before, it's very inconvenient, very frustrating to load music onto the device. With Spotify and Deezer, you need to use you need to have a paid subscription. So I don't have I don't have Spotify. I have to use uh, I use Google Music. Unfortunately, Amazon Music only works in the US. I'm in Canada, so it doesn't work at all. So I can't preload anything with Amazon Music. Google Music doesn't work at all, and I don't want to pay for a Spotify subscription. Now I did use the app called Runcast, and I found and I found that it was very very good. I was able to load music, but I find that having to search on my phone and then sync it. That whole process is really annoying because it takes a while to sync a podcast. It does eat through your battery every time you sync. So it's kind of just annoying, just all this stuff. And then navigating on the watch, getting to the music control and starting your kind of music that you can't seek through it. You can't set the multiplier. You can't say like, oh, I want to listen to this podcast at 1.5 X. Uh, speed. So there's a lot of things that are missing that are on a basic phone app that you can do really easily. So if you don't want to use Wi-Fi to sync music using the typical way, using like Spotify, you can actually just connect this device to your computer and simply load music onto it really fast. But I haven't found any desktop apps where I can download podcasts and I don't know how to download music and, and put it onto on my computer because it's, you know, that's obviously illegal unless you have iTunes, but I'm not sure if you can even pull that music and put it onto your device. So it's pretty much useless for me if I'm using a local transfer on my Windows machine. Now, what I I do find very helpful is using the shortcut gesture by swiping right and displaying the music control widget. That was really, really nice feature that they added. I'm able to kind of control the music on my phone so I can change the volume. I can uh, pause or, or uh, move forward or backward. That's very convenient. However, if you want to use music local on your smartwatch, but also control your smartphone, you have to go really deep into the settings and go to music providers and then change it to music control on your phone versus local music. So that was a terrible, terrible experience. If I want to toggle between playing music locally or controlling my phone remotely, you have to go through all these, all these steps just to switch between the two. That's not intuitive. It's not a fun user experience. It's very cumbersome. Now, another annoyance when you're using local music, when you're streaming from your watch, is that you have to connect it using Bluetooth. And some most my, my Bluetooth devices only allow one connection. If you have a headphone that allows for multiple connections, maybe you're okay from this kind of complaint. But let's say you want to use your Bluetooth headphones on your smartwatch, you have to pair them. And let's say you want to use that same Bluetooth headphone, but on a different phone, you have to unpair it on your watch and then pair it to your phone. And that, that experience of having to manually pair your Bluetooth headset to either your phone or your computer or your smartwatch is just way too much work just to like go out and enjoy your life. I'm sorry, but I have to say that's completely useless for me. And I really wish that I was able to not buy a Vivo Active 4 with music. I wish they would, you know, provide a subsidy or a cheaper version so that you don't, you can buy the same watch, but without music. So in terms of the Connect app that's uh, featured on your Android phone or on your iOS device, 
It's obviously a fantastic app that allows you to access all the information from your Garmin watch. It's totally beautiful. It's, it's a really intuitive type of application on your phone that you can use to kind of just navigate and see your sleep tracking data, see all your running metrics or your strength training exercises. It's just good all around. And I covered this a lot in detail in my previous video. So I don't want to go into detail and kind of repeat what I said. It's all, it, nothing has really changed since the previous versions. Additionally, you can go on your laptop or your desktop and load a web app, which basically is the same version of the Connect app, but presents all your information on a nice big monitor. So that is very helpful for you if you want to see your information on your desktop. Now for me, I, I mentioned this before in the past, this has been a recurring theme for me with Garmin is that I really wish that these, this Connect app would provide some information such as insights, such as you know, sleep quality, how is your sleep? Can you rate it? Uh, can you determine if I'm going to get sick? You know, I would really uh, appreciate if they would provide some insight. And I know that Fitbit is doing a premium service where it kind of does this. It kind of looks at your da data, analyzes it, and then provides you with some insight. And I really wish that Garmin would do something similar because I have all this data. I have all this information. I've been tracking it for months and, and weeks and whatnot. And I just don't know what to do with it. Like respiration rate, like what am I supposed to do with that? Sleep, sleep data, knowing what my deep sleep is versus my REM sleep. That has been very helpful in understanding that, you know, what what conditions prior to that night would allow me to get better sleep. That has been helpful, but I just kind of wish they would just summarize the data and give you suggestions and ways to improve your life. They have all this information. I don't know why they can't just analyze it and, you know, at least try to give us some insights. So I had some people comment on my previous video on the Forerunner 245 to do a comparison of the Vivo Active 4 versus the Forerunner 245. And I noticed that given that if you compare the music edition of the Forerunner 245 with the Vivo Active 4, to me, in my opinion, I would definitely go with the Vivo Active 4. With all the new sensors, such as a thermometer, a gyroscope, an altimeter, perhaps you're into staircase climbing or you're very curious about your elevation level as you move around. These types of exercises, you can only get it with the Vivo Active 4. Another thing that Vivo Active 4 has over the Forerunner 245 is all types of golf activities. The Forerunner 245 does have a slightly bigger screen at 42 millimeters. The screen display is a little bit higher resolution is actually a little bit lighter at 30, 38.5 grams versus 40 grams for the 4S. And that's because it's using a more kind of a less premium type of build quality because it doesn't have a stainless steel type of bezel. It's all made of polymer plastic. But if you prefer buttons and you prefer not having a touchscreen, this might be the kind of device that you would rather have, especially if you are actually a hardcore runner. If you're a runner and you need all those advanced metrics and data tracking when you're running, you might want to just get the Forerunner 245. But for me, having the Garmin Pay, which is not on the Forerunner 245, all day pulse ox tracking, all day respiration tracking, that stuff is really important for me. I find it very interesting. So for the same price, I would definitely always get the Vivo Active 4. So in conclusion, I think that the Vivo Active 4 is one of the best smartwatches Garmin has put out yet. It has taken all the good stuff from all the other different types of devices like the Phoenix series and the Forerunner 245 and kind of combined it into one package that is more focused on smart features like music and all day pulse stocks tracking and really good notifications. So if you're into that, a, a watch that is very lightweight, but also very stylish, looks very nice on the wrist. I definitely think the Vivo Active 4 is the type of watch that you're going to want. I really do like that they have all-day pulse ox. That has been giving me some really cool insights into my sleep. Now, for me, telling the time is one, the number one feature I need when I wear a watch. So the always-on display is a huge benefit over other types of traditional type of smartwatches like the Wear OS or Apple Watch or the Venue type of series. And I noticed that they're starting to do all, you know, always on display as well. However, the battery life on those are pretty bad. And, you know, you're going to get one to two days max. And having seven day battery life or five days, depending on what you use in terms of pulse ox, has been more helpful in me not having to constantly be anxious or worried about having to charge my device all the time. Now, unfortunately, with the Vivo Active 4, not everything is so bright and shiny. Unfortunately, auto set and the strength training type of exercises they detect are kind of inaccurate. And it's been pretty much a deal breaker for me because this is one of the major features why I bought this uh, smartwatch. Now, in terms of what I want to see in the future from Garmin watches, I really, really wish they would start, you know, adding voice to their to their smartwatches because interacting with the device with all the buttons or touchscreens can be very annoying at times when you want to do a quick task. Remember, remember a note or uh, set a timer or set a reminder. I really wish they would have Alexa or Google Assistant. I mean, it's 2019. This is a feature that is an, almost unnecessary for any kind of smartwatch. Another thing that I wish Garmin would really improve on is the de developer experience. I noticed that their app market isn't very mature. When you compare it to Wear OS or the Apple Watch, 
their app market is very mature because they have a really good developer experience. You're developing with a modern language, so it's very easy to build apps. I'm a developer myself. I really wish I can go in and kind of jump in and build some apps, but their kind of market or their app store isn't very intuitive. I tried a lot of apps and they're just all very cumbersome to use. So I really wish they would provide a really good SDK with a modern language so that it makes developing apps more of a joy for developers. I think if they improve on this and really invest in it, they can actually build a smartwatch that is very, very competitive with Apple Watch and Wear OS. Now, the last thing I want to say about the Vivo Active 4S is the price. This is a very expensive watch. It costs about $480 plus tax in Canada. And this is very expensive, especially when you compare it to an Apple Watch. It's pretty much the same price as an Apple Watch, the, new, the newest series. So you're paying a lot for the premium features like pulse axe tracking, all day pulse axe tracking, and all that other stuff like the always on display. At this price point, I really do think that they could offer more value. I know they've already offered a lot, but you know, voice assistant or a better app developer experience would be really helpful. My light just ran out of battery and my camera is about to die. I've been speaking way too long about this smartwatch. I apologize if it was too long. I really hope it was insightful and it was very detailed and it helped you make your decision. Anyways, that's all for now. Thanks for watching this video and I really hope to see you in the next one. Oh, and one last thing, this video took hours and a lot of hard work to make. So if you can give a like, it would really help out the channel. And definitely hit click the subscribe button if you want to hear more wearable related content.